bad. It's that bad. I kid you not. Do not go out there and do not breathe the air out there. You were out. No, just now when I looked out. Right now it's really bad. All right, good evening, everyone. If I'm not mistaken, it is AITB time. Don't you worry about the stadium sounding in here. That's just the way it is. We are the only open mic without a mic. Thank you for being respectful. So let me introduce to you the man who will guide you through this evening. All right. <laughs> Sorry, that was loud. OK, so <laughs> without further ado, please help me welcome the man who will guide you through this evening, author of four novels, an all-around good neighbor, and once known as the minor god in the Chicago poetry scene, help me welcome Tim W. Brown, everyone. Thank you, everyone, here, live at Montemar Coffee and Wine, in the room, and as well, people on Zoom, thank you, and welcome. We have a kind of a fun crowd here tonight couple of comedians, if I'm not mistaken, uh, as well as a couple of other participants. Uh, thanks so much for coming out and braving the weird ass weather that we're having. If you want to call it that, it's not really weather. It's we're being afflicted by forest fire smoke <laughs> coming down from upper Canada. Uh, so that's that burnt wood smell you've been uh, experiencing out there. So sorry for that, and thank you for braving it once again. You know, often I start these readings, uh, or these events that we do here, uh, reading a poem that I pick up from Poem Hunter. It's a, an app as well as a, a website where they have thousands of poems of all different subjects by famous and not so famous poets. I looked up pollution today. There really wasn't anything. Sorry to say, looked up air pollution, uh, looked up smoke, not really anything very apropos. But then I ran across uh, this other site called Poetry Soup. And there is a poem that I found there today that is, was written today. I'm certain of it, given it's a subject matter. It's from an Eileen Bauer and it's called Unhealthy Air. I'm sitting in unhealthy air. The sky is filled with haze from fires up in Canada with acres still ablaze. This morning's sun was glorious, an orange pinkish ball resulting from the smoke but still admired and snapped by all, including me. I took a picture of it tonight, uh, this morning. It's apropos because today, in 1944, the Normandy invasion turned the tide to change the war. Those soldiers suffered more than just the quality of air and fewer people every year know of the battles there. So here I am on D-Day thinking of that sacrifice as I sit and breathe unhealthy air against some good advice. Eileen Bauer, everyone, unhealthy air. Yeah. It's like a, a snap poem, right? Isn't that what they call that when you write a poem that's uh, just right off the top of your head based on the morning that you're doing it uh, and whatever topic grabs you? Anyhow, thank you again for coming out. Uh, we are coming towards the end of the Art in the Basin spring season. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Catherine, who's here. Uh, we'll be up here uh, momentarily for coming out tonight, and as well as all open micers and people who are supporters and have been supporters for a very long time now. Thank you, as always, to Monomore Coffee and Wine for hosting us here. And after six years, still doing it pretty much every other Tuesday, except when we're on summer hiatus. Uh, 
We will not be here next week, which would have normally been our uh, time, but for the New York Philharmonic is playing a few blocks away in Van Cortlandt Park that night, and we didn't want to have uh, that competition, <laughs> honestly. No, we wanted to go. <laughs> yeah, well, as well, we kind of wanted to go. The whole neighborhood turns out. Uh, but we'll be back for our final show of the spring season on the 27th of June uh, with Soraya Shalkarush. All the way from New Jersey coming here. Anyway. Tonight, we have gracing us uh, with her presence and, and words, and uh, please feel free to do a whole set. Uh, Catherine. Catherine Arnoldi is the author of the amazing tr true story of a teenage single mom, a graphic novel, Gray Malkin Press, and all things are labor stories from the University of Massachusetts Press. She's published fiction in a gathering of the tribes, Blue Collar Review, Five Minute Fiction, Room of One's Own, The World, Long Shot, Fiction, The Quarterly, On the Bus, Red Tape, Tragic Comics, and New Observations. I've actually been published in both On the Bus and New Observations, so there you go. Uh, and it is on the bus, like all capital letters, one word. Anyway, let's bring up Catherine. Now, what's that? There is not much of a mic except for this, which is more for the Zoom audience. Um, if you'd like to like come up closer, we could probably accommodate that, right? Can we do that? A little bit closer? No, we can't do that? I can hardly hear you. Oh, okay. I can hardly hear you. Okay. Yeah. Here. Because it's being live streamed from YouTube. Uh, okay. No, I'm good. I have to hold this. Can I yes. put this down somewhere? Or, um, yeah. So I'll just hold it for you, or, or just put it up there or something. Like, I have to hold it. It's okay. Come on. All right. You're here. I'm not going to look at that. It's okay. All right. Um, okay. Sorry. I was like, I was like getting used to, used to the place and, and acclimating myself. I'm so glad that you guys are here. And I'm so glad to, uh, to be here. And I thank AJ and Tim for their great work, um, for their great work here. Uh, Joan of Arc at the rave. I don't know how she found it here in Williamsburg at an empty warehouse with a nondescript door. She need a password to get in. Did she know it? She takes the microphone from the DJ. The techno music still blares, but I think she wants everyone to follow her to take up arms. Everyone raises their arm. Yeah, maybe I need some water. I'm sorry. Oh, sure. No. Oh. No, I don't need this. Did you want to sit? <laughs> I don't know if I want to do this at all to tell you the truth, but because of the people talking, it's not. It's too, I know it's a restaurant. And plus, there's no mic. 
So we are the only open mic without a mic. That's part of that's part, that's of, part of our charm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. on the most part. Um, may I ask everyone in the room to speak in a very quiet tone if you must communicate with your neighbor so that Catherine can absolutely they're share not, her not, beautiful piece with, it's okay. Please. Thank you. Joan of Arc and the Raid. I don't know how she found it here in Williamsburg at an empty warehouse with a nondescript door. You need a password to get in. Did she know it? She takes a microphone from the DJ. The techno music still blares, and I think she wants everyone to follow her, to take up arms. Everyone waves their arm, raises their arms and waves them back and forth like a huge sea. She says we need to fire, fire, fire the arms, and a thousand lighters sway in the dark. Let's go, she says, and she takes a multicolored flag and waves it, marches to the door. A little line of dancers follow her, and everyone joins, hands on the hips of the dancers in front of them. She opens the door and disappears outside. We circle back to the dance floor, wonder why she left so early. You could just take another minute to be a little more. Are you ready to go again? Don't worry about that. My landlord has taken over, over the, the world. world. He is collecting, collecting all, the all the rent. He is, he is out, in, out the hall. in the hall. He has a key to your lock. He your lock. He says you got, he your, says got your kitchen. I can't do it. I can't do it. It's okay. All right. Catherine Arnaldi, everyone. Thank you. All right. Back to Tim. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I am uh, a bit regretful uh, that we, you know, thank you, uh, Catherine, for the attempt, uh, just the oxygen deprivation alone tonight <laughs> with the smoke would make things very difficult. Uh, we are the open mic that really doesn't have an, a mic. We've always been kind of known for that. Um, so anyway, thank you um, for coming out, uh, being a... A trooper and we'll get you back um we have some people here uh who are signed up for the open mic we had a clipboard floating oh. around but i'm just trying to see who is up here tonight uh i don't know should we go with clyde clyde would you like to come on up clyde everybody please welcome clyde Make sure you. Yeah. I have a how, how long do you want me to go on? A few minutes. All right. Oh, I have a, very much a bit in uh, in order here. Uh, uh, I uh, <clears throat> a lot of people know that I am an a lot of people know <clears throat> that I am an uh, uh, a classical sort of comedian. You know, I uh, I don't really think of anything uh, beyond 1995. And uh, recently, I've uh, uh, been very interested in a classic comedian who is actually still alive to this day, Mr. Bob Newhart. I'm happy to say that Bob Newhart is still alive at the age of 93, and hopefully me talking about him doesn't kill him. 
uh, but uh, watching one of his classic bits, I decided, well, I'm going to do my own version of that. Uh, so uh, without ado, this is Clyde Woodham as Bob Newhart via, I don't know, 1968. <laughs> Hello? Yes, yes, this is this is this is Bob Newhart. Is my refrigerator running? Actually no uh, no, um, no it's not. Are, are you the uh, you the uh, repairman I called about 20 minutes ago? Oh, you're not. Well, uh, uh well, no, 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 no. Now uh, now you don't know what to do. <laughs> no, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, um, I don't find this, <clears throat> I don't find this, um, awkward at all. No, 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 there's, there's, there's no need to apologize, no, no. What's that? How, uh, have I never heard of this joke before? Well, I'm, I'm 93 years old, I probably, uh, I probably just, uh, I probably just uh, forgot. <laughs> what do I remember? Well, I I, uh, I seem to I seem to remember uh, pogs. What are pogs? Couldn't tell you. Sorry. Thank you. Bob knew our phone book. Uh, I was thinking the other day too. It's, uh, there is actually well, not a brick wall, but there are bricks behind me. And any uh, comedian worth their salt has to perform in front of a brick wall. <laughs> and I'm very happy to say that yes, uh, I have about this much. And I'm not one to be topical, but I couldn't help but notice uh, walking outside in the uh, air being filled with uh, smoke <laughs> on account of uh, all of Canada is on fire. <laughs> I don't know, like, it's, it's weird to be outside under a hazy gray cloud and uh, have your lungs itch. But I think it's it's nice to be a, a, a in a brief part of history. You know, you can say, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." The world is constantly falling apart, and we're a big part of that. <laughs> but I'll say this too: like I uh, I work in Brooklyn at a bar, and I work from five to five, and I get usually get back home at about uh, six thirty, seven o'clock in the morning. And when I got home this morning at about six thirty, uh, I don't know if any of you caught this. But the moon was a person, uh, a perfectly uh, orange cream disc floating in the sky. No, it was the moon reflecting the light of the sun. Or maybe that was the sun. Or was it muted by all the smoke? Is that what it was? Ah, okay. You see, the smoke made the sun look prettier than it normally does. I thought it was the moon. I stare at the sun all the time. Yes. Uh, you want me? I can keep going. Okay, yes. Um, when is it? Oh, you know, a lot of people these days talk about all the reasons uh, that you shouldn't hate people. But what about the reasons that is uh, okay to hate someone? Like, uh, they ruined your life. <laughs> or like, uh, they savagely beat you on a daily basis. Or, uh, this happened to me once. They walked uh, straight up to me, they looked me in the eyes and said, well, I would rather have sex with Guy Fieri than even talk to you. <laughs> I think it's okay to hate those people. Uh, you want me to talk about Dan DiCarlo for like 10 minutes? Dan DiCarlo was perhaps the greatest artist to ever draw Archie comics. Uh, you know, like people thought they knew Betty and Veronica in 1941. No, they didn't know Betty and Veronica until like 1951 when Dan DiCarlo started drawing them. Yeah. Uh, they got somewhere they get their, all the Archie characters get their cartoonish looks. And, uh, you know, as someone who once played Betty from the Archies for 30 minutes in a long play, that happened. 
I can tell you that, you know, I felt like, I didn't feel like a, a Doug Crane drawing. No, I felt like a Dan DiCarlo drawing. I really was being broadcast over the airwaves and the internet, alongside reruns of Northern Exposure and Cheers and George Reeves, Superman, and all that. No, it's true. It's true. Uh, and I appreciate that. I, I, thank you for watching. Like, yeah, we're here. Uh, we're at Mona Moore, or in the basin, everybody. I brought my phone. I forgot my beer. But yeah, that's. It's over there. It's next to Claudia. Thank you, Claudia, my roommate, everybody. Yeah. I'll probably need a lawyer soon, so thank you. I wish I brought my Yakov Smirnov jacket. Have you guys, did you guys ever think about that? Do you remember like uh, in the 80s, people would wear jackets, but they were short sleeved? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know about you, but I think that kind of uh, defeats the purpose of the jacket. Because um, I don't know, I, don't, I, may, I, may, I may not be the sharpest knife in the drawer, but uh, if I wore a jacket like that, my uh, uh, arms would get cold. <laughs> Morbius the vampire, everybody. Morbius the vampire. Wow, okay, I'm going to keep going. Like, just, just, just get the big cane when, when you're done with it. Get the big cane, pull me off. Uh... So Fozzie Bear is in the news again today. Uh, no, <laughs> no, I, I that's something as a stand up as a stand up comedian that is a hazard you have to think about is uh, at what point am I going to say something and people will throw tomatoes at me? You know. Well, that's the thing. If you're a struggling artist and you're really poor and hungry, the audience throwing tomatoes at you uh, means that that night you will be able to eat. <laughs> I get a lot of lycopene in my diet, everybody. Apparently that's good for you if you're like a race car driver. Yeah, what's with this old Richard Petty thing, am I right? He was a race car driver. Yeah. Well, I think that's enough for me. I'm glad, I'm glad you guys enjoyed my Bob Newhart bit. Uh, you'll be seeing me do that in Vegas seven nights a week, uh, about nine years from now. Uh, hopefully Bob Newhart will be alive. Thank you. Thank you, Clyde. Thank you. You know, uh, we will have a, another season that starts up uh, really in August. Uh, we'll let you know more about it, but AITB will be going OTR on the road. Uh, we'll let you know a bit more about that. Uh, and as well, uh, opening our fall season is our very own Clyde. Doing a full on set. Um, I love this name. It is so pretty. Is there a Eurydice? Eurydice. You're nice. You're really up the cheap. hill at uh, Am Biel Bach. Um, there is a bartender named Cassandra, and I just think that is such a cool name. She wants to be called Cass or Cassie, and I'm like, no, Cassandra. It's such a beautiful name. Like you're a dicey. Right. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks for registering. Uh, let's see. Who else do we have on board? Well, shoot. Maybe we should ask up Adam. Adam. And if I turn my phone off, Those who don't know, I have come here and I find life very interesting in its very, very otherwise normal moments. In other words, I try to discover the extraordinary or the unusual in the pedestrian. And there's no place really more pedestrian, especially post-pandemic, 
than the supermarket. So I got a supermarket store. And like most stores, this one is culturally based. But you have to dig a little deeper. Uh, there are people that are very fortunate, so they see. They get to go to the Hamptons every summer. There are others that go to the Jersey Shore. Don't ever call it the beach. <laughs> then there are people that go to the Berkshires. Now, many years ago, going to the Berkshires was a great alternative to going to the Hamptons. Now the Hamptons have come to the Berkshires. And so what we have is what we who have been going there on and off over the years, what we have is the, what we call uh, very sort of uh, euphemistically, the Hamptonization of the Berkshires. So you thought you were gonna get away from it. Well, I don't know about you guys, but Going to the Hamptons ain't getting away from it for me. Not when I gotta spend that whole damn weekend with people that I want to avoid anyway. So, at least I thought I was gonna do that in the Berkshires. Well, this story of the supermarket tells you that your hopes and aspirations to do that are in a steep decline. There, there is a local supermarket in the Berkshires that caters to people that would otherwise go to the Hamptons. They have, they, their prices are steep enough so that Whole Foods doesn't have to come in and look expensive. So, and, and they started out very, very, very mundanely as a little fruit stand. Its name is Guido's. And for those of us of an age, about 50 years ago, all the fruit sellers on fruit stores were tiny. And they sold out to the Koreans, now the landlords. That's another story. Up in the Berkshires, we don't know had success. And to get put, put it in geographic perspective, there are subcultures and little towns in the Berkshires, without getting into too much detail, the money is in Lenox, Massachusetts. I've never seen so many stores, by the way, where you have nothing that you ever need to sell. Nothing. I've never seen so many clothing stores. I, I thought maybe there was like a direct container every week from uh, China and India for all the clothing up to Lenox, Massachusetts. But that's, again, another story. There's that much money in Lenox. Guido's is in Lenox, and then another town in the Berkshires, further south, called Great Barrington, which is now just beginning to see its Hamptonization. But this story takes place in Guido's, in Lenox. And you may think, like, why are you even talking about a store that makes Whole Foods look cheap? Well, it's because of the type of store that Guido's is. It's what we would call a, um, a concession store, meaning that the name on the front of the store are the people that own the lease, they own a department or two, and then everything else is by concession. So in the civilized world outside of New York, uh, you get to buy wine in a grocery store. There's a wine concession, there's a deli concession, there's a meat concession, there's a fish concession, and so on. The fruit is obviously a Guido's. But the concession for me is by another bunch of Italians called Mazeo. Mazeo operates both the meat and the fish concession, and they actually operate, and they call it this, an upscale Italian steakhouse, a little further up the road from this particular supermarket. Well, their meat, Barbara doesn't eat meat, my wife doesn't eat meat, except she makes exceptions for Guido's ground beef. And Guido's ground beef is one of the few things that you can actually walk into Guido's and walk out without a mortgage. So, so, <laughs> so we will go up 
to the Berkshires, and if we go up for the day, we'll take it home. If we go up for a couple of days, we'll take it home at the end of the day and pack it in our Florida ceiling freezer at home. I don't mean we fill the whole freezer with you know, ground beef, but we buy a bit of it. Now, I am a guy that loves meat. And as an aside, I've got to say this because I had this incredible doctor visit when I was about 40 years of age. And this doctor was very old world Hungarian, Dr. Thomas Molnar. And I've had a running battle with cholesterol my whole life. So he takes my blood and he sits me down and he says, this is Dolan. And he goes through, you have this in your blood, you have that. He said, but there's a precedent. There, you, you must eat a lot of red meat. There's, there's a, a chemical in your blood that indicates you eat a lot of med, red meat. Now, this guy is charming. He's sort of like a, like, like a 1950s movie with a hat and everything. He's Hungarian. I mean, you, you know, real European. And what I really want to say to him, and this is, this is part of the aside, is no shit, Doc. I've been eating it. I've been eating steak since I've been three years old. No wonder you found that chemical. But I don't say it to him because he's a very, very charming guy. And I kind of go back to the doctor Nick here anyway. Anyway, so Barbara and I are at the meat counter in Guido's, and we're speaking with the butcher, who happens to be a young lady in this case. Now. But people who go to the Hamptons or go to the Berkshires or go to the Jersey Shore fail often to understand is that the people that are serving here are what we call locals. They live there. So when you go home on Tuesday morning and show up on, on Thursday night during the summer, or when you come up for a long weekend in the fall, they're working Monday through Friday or Tuesday through Saturday, and they're there to serve you. And they don't have the luxury of what you are enjoying or experiencing. So, let's call this butcher. Her name might be called Kathy. I don't remember what her name was. So, in the Berkshires, like in a lot of small towns, a lot of places outside of New York, people, people are actually friendly. And they do what we used to say in the other state, keep it sweet. They talk with you. They want to know how you are. They want, yeah, just how are things going? And the pace of life is a lot slower. And nobody's in a rush to get anywhere. Where are you going to go? You're shopping in Guido's, okay? It's, a, it's an experience. So this butcher, Kathy, says to us, turns to Barbara, goes, I'm local, are you? You know, I don't recognize you. Where are you from? So, of course, we said, the Bronx, New York. She goes, oh, I, got, I got a story for you. Some story. She tells, and Kath, let's call her Kathy, and the other, uh, the other butcher of the story would be Joan. So, Kathy and Joan are serving a busy clientele on Saturday, let's call it Saturday morning. There's actually two of them at the butcher cafe. And there's a long line, three people. So, they're kibitzing the customers. And then they see this well to do couple come up to the line. And she can tell that they're well to do. She looks at their dress and their airs. They sort of look, you know, not quite like they belong there. New, they bought, like they're new, they bought a new house or something, or a new condo or whatever it is. In any event, a line is moving forward. Joan is finishing up with a customer. And as the butchers are looking at the line who to serve, this next, this couple is getting next here. Here, and ants here. You see all the nonverbals. It's a, uh, what's the Everything they don't tell you, they're telling you by what they're doing. 
What's thinking is before so long? So, the second. So, the first thing says, Don't worry, I'll take care of it. And just like that, turns around. And it's as if it's a comedian, sorry, global respect, a comedian that looks away from the audience and she addresses this Time's a waste in here. Tell me what you need. You can see the couple exhale. Ah, it's nice to be abused again. <laughs> Thank you, Adam, as always, for your observations uh, on life. Um, yeah, don't we have insane liquor store laws here? I moved here 20 years ago now in 2003, and one of the first questions that emerged from my mouth was like, wait, you cannot buy beer, wine, and liquor in the same store? Oh. Not used to it since then, but uh, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, well, let's see here. Uh, maybe we should hear next from Eric. Eric Rosenbaum, everyone. Then we'll hear from Mary and... How can I do? I'm not going to do my elaborate collection thing. Okay. But I am going to put on a beat. I need you here. Yes. So, can I hold the beats? Sure. Right here. Right here. Okay. Next one's the spot. Let's see. Okay. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you. Uh -huh. You got Amy, it. I think I have it. Okay. And I've been enjoying my high lie beer specialty over here. So let's give this a shot here. The name of this song is I Always Make the Same Mistake. mistake you think I would have learned by now I always make the same mistake you think I would have learned by now oh you think I would have learned I never get burned but I have a burn by now I thought I remembered all the words but I forgot some now so let me try that again I always make the same mistake you think I would have learned by now I always make the same mistake. You think I would have learned by now? You think I would have learned? I always get burned. You think I would have learned by now? The love I'm given never is returned. You think I would have learned by now? I'm not going to forget this one, especially since I'm frozen and nobody's going to hear except, except the people that are here. I always make the same mistake. You think I would have changed by now? I always make the same mistake. You think I would have changed by now? I can never tell who's 
on the make who's for real and who's a fake you always make the same mistake you think i would have changed by now I'm not going to forget this one either. I always make the same mistake. I should have wised up by now. I always make the same mistake. I should have wised up by now. Oh, interesting. Let's go. I always make the same mistake. I should have wised up by now. I always make the same mistake. I should have wised up by now. They always play me for the fool. Oh, so sweet, then oh, so cruel. Like I never even went to school. I should have wised up and done a prenup. I should have wised up by now. <laughs> make the same mistake I should have caught on by now I always make the same mistake I should have caught on by now I always make the same mistake and I can hear them talking at my wake he can never tell who's real who's fake he could never tell when the town went off. He could never tell who's real who's fake. He could never tell who's on the make. Too late for him to learn that now. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. That happens. <laughs> I figured it out. <laughs> Thank you for your patience out there in uh, Zoom land. In YouTube land and right here in this cafe, right? Vote more coffee and wine. Woo! Uh, right. So, sort of hearing myself here in my head and that way. Okay. We're still working out the kinks. <laughs> these things. So, thank you for your indulgence and thank you, Eric, for that song. Uh, I never learned from my mistakes either. That seems to be like my MO, pretty much. Uh, so let's see. Let's bring up, like, uh, and she was here before, and we really loved her. She was very funny. Mary. Oh, I see. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think I did it. Is it happening for everyone? I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Obviously, my voice is there, but. <laughs> So odd. All right, Mary, you know what to do, project. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm going to read a, a, a story I did for the Listen to Your Mother show. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it, but there's a show called Listen to Your Mother. They do it in every state. And I was one of the cast members on the show. So I'm just going to read a little bit from what I wrote. The title is Betty Before and After. My mother Betty had two passions in life, cleaning and shopping for the elderly. Therefore, I grew up in one of the cleanest apartments in Upper Manhattan, surrounded by well-fed seniors. The neighbors loved to visit. They enjoyed the order, the cleanliness, the smell of spick and span as they sipped tea and discussed what was on sale at the local supermarket. My mother was a welcome guest in other homes as well because she never dropped a crumb on the carpet and would even do a little dusting with her napkin if she happened to find a speck of dust in her immediate surroundings. She was kind, easygoing, and cared for everyone. Growing up, my best friend Sue and I would tell her everything, like the time we ran home from the neighborhood pool and told her about the nice old man who was holding us up in the water and teaching us to swim. Oh my God, she yelled, he was probably feeling you up. Needless to say, we didn't go alone again to the pool that summer or anywhere else for that matter. She was known in the neighborhood for her beautiful brown eyes because my father, an alcoholic, told everyone he met on his way home from the bar how much he loved them. The neighbors were always giving her advice on how to cure her. Mrs. Schumacher said if my mother put an aspirin in his beer, he'd fall asleep and not drink so much. Mrs. Galley said if my mother didn't feed him so well, he might get sick and stop drinking altogether. Despite her promises to try both remedies, my mother continued to dress up his ham, and, his ham steak with pineapple and a cherry, no matter what condition he was in. She loved him as much as he loved her brown eyes. One day, after my mother had just finished mopping the floor, she heard my father's key in our apartment's front door and yelled to him not to walk on the red floor. Having had one too many at the bar, he sat down right inside the front door and fell asleep, blocking the door, making it impossible for anyone to get in or out of our apartment. I don't know if it was a Irish strength or the desire to get to bingo that gave her the courage to crawl out the window and climb up the fire escape into the Hanrahan's apartment so she could get out of the house. The Hanrahan children were delighted to see their favorite neighbor, Betty, climbed through the window, but things got a little ugly when little Dennis wanted to keep her lucky rubber leprechaun that fell out of her pocket. She never went to bingo without it. These are the stories I told the social worker in the nursing home when she asked me to tell her who the real Betty was, not the Betty who was being admitted with the mind of a two-year-old. I will never forget that day. My heart was broken and I cried all the way home. It was midnight and I was just dozing off to sleep when the phone rang. For a second, I didn't recognize my mother's voice as she whispered into the phone, they're going to steal my key. Who? The nurses. Mom, that's not true. I heard them and they have it all planned. Why would they want them? You have false teeth, there is no about a month maid announced the nurse shook your mother mom did miss claire shake you yes she put her hands on my shoulders and kept shaking me she can't do that well she did the next time scream as loud as you can and don't stop until someone comes when did she shake you 
Well, my mother said it was right after I hit many in the nose. Thank you. That's Thank you, Mary, for that. Another side of uh, Mary. Oh, hey, it appears we have gotten back John and Elizabeth. The Elegant Ivory Duo, uh, we think, are online. I see their pictures here. Maybe we'll uh, ask them to perform. Uh, happy birthday, Elizabeth. Yesterday was her birthday. I hope you had a happy, happy one. Uh, I understand you even performed live last night. Uh, so uh, look, looking forward to seeing more of that. I would love to come out. Uh, John and Elizabeth. We're working on the buttons. You like that or you are? Oh, but uh, <laughs> where are we? I think we're up. <laughs> well, we're not there yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, our, our video isn't spotlighted or whatever it is. Ah, oh, there we Hello. are. Well, congratulations, one and all, AITB, and all you wonderful people that make it possible. Amy and Tim, it's been a wonderful ride here with you for a few years. Yeah. Um, we've decided tonight to do a. Uh, we've gone here before, but so so popular, and with, with the occasion of the sixth anniversary. Um, so this song is written in 1980, and uh, that written by uh, Moore Dixon and Harry Warren. Harry Warren's a very famous composer. So uh, it's a little out of date, but it's still one of the most famous songs, and has been recorded by like a hundred artists. I'm going to the piano. Hello, we're gonna have fun. <laughs> yes, whenever you're ready. You got it? Is your light working? Almost. Okay. <laughs> Hot ginger and dynamite. There's nothing but that at night. Back in Nagasaki, where the fellows chew tobacco and the women wiki wacky woo. The way they can entertain would hurry a hurricane. Back in Nagasaki, where the fellows chew tobacco and the women wiki wacky woo. In Fujiyama, you get a mama and your troubles increase. Earthshake, milkshakes, ten cents apiece. They kissy and huggy nights. Oh, by jingo, it's worth the price. Back in Nagasaki, where the fellows chew tobacco and the women wiki wacky woo. Huh. Hey, Johnny, what exactly is wiki wacky woo? What does it mean? Well, if you don't know what wiki wacky woo is by this age, I don't know what to tell you. They give you a carriage free. The horse is a Japanese. Back in Nagasaki, where the fellows chew tobacco and the women wiki wacky woo. They you No wonder your pants get sore. Back in Nagasaki, where the fellows chew tobacco and the women wiki wacky woo. I Palatosis, that's guaranteed. You just have to act your rage or wind up inside of a cage. Back in Nagasaki, where the fellows chew tobacco and the women wiki wacky woo. Sorry, 
Tis, if it is, is, heaven help a sailor on a night like this. Not too gentle and not too rough, but you've got to tell them when you've had enough. Back in Nagasaki, where the fellows chew tobacco and the women wiki wacky woo. Those tortoises and baby deuces, heaven help a sailor on a night like this. Not too gentle and not too rough, but you gotta tell them when you've had enough. Back in Nagasaki, where the fellas chew tobacco. <coughs> and the women wiki wacky woo. -hoo. Back in Nagasaki, where the fellas chew tobacco, and the women wiki wacky woo. -hoo. And the women wiki wacky woo. Aha. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Stop <laughs> <laughs>
They lifted me. Their prayers spurred my hopes, my desire to heal. I would be that miracle that all the world would wonder at, marvel at. After all, who had a stronger body, a sharper will than I? God does. God has chosen to turn me into a pillar of salt. I can no longer move. I can no longer speak. All that I can do is pray that he releases me from my bondage and takes me to him. I'm a man like any other. There have been good deeds and bad. Then why, Lord? Why me? Why am I being slowly erased? Why is death delayed for me? Here I lay in this hospital bed, so alone and so afraid. And I cannot wipe the tears from my face. That's it. More time for that. Well, I didn't mean to kill the whole evening. <laughs> Not gonna hear me doing that. <laughs> I'm good. All right, I have it. Not only do I got it, I have it. <laughs> uh, we have one more open micer. Who is? Claudia. Claudia. All right. All right. I was so inspired by Clyde, I decided to get up and tell some jokes. Stand here, X marks the spot. Got it. Yes. Yeah. So I was going through, going through some notes in my phone, and some of them don't make sense. I sometimes will wake up in the middle of the night and just write down ideas. And sometimes these are good ideas, and then sometimes they'll just say things like, "Guy." <laughs> if anyone knows what I meant by that, please tell me, um, because it would be very helpful. I think that could be the germ of a really good idea. Um, so, does anyone actually wear ski masks for skiing? <laughs> because I think maybe they should be more accurately renamed to burglary masks. <laughs> so I went to the doctor recently. At the time I wrote this joke, it was recently. Now it's a few years ago. Uh, I went to the doctor recently, and it turns out I have high blood pressure. Um, I don't look really good for being in my 50s. I'm just really unhealthy for being in my 30s. <laughs> uh, I had actually gone into urgent care because I was having like a, I was sick. I was having a different problem. And the doctors were really not worried about that. They were really worried about like getting me into an appointment with a cardiologist as soon as possible. And I can tell you that an experience I do not recommend is going to the doctor for a simple problem and them being way more worried about your health than you are. <laughs> you know, and it was pretty intensive. They sent me to a cardiologist. I had to overgo because, you know, it's like weird for someone of my age to like go into the doctor and like have high blood pressure. So it involved really extensive tests. It was like I went in and I had to have an appointment with the cardiologist. And then in follow up, they had to hook me up to like, I had to go home like with a blood pressure monitor on me that monitored for monitored me for 24 hours. I had to I had to go in for a follow up appointment after that. And my third appointment, I had to go in for an ultrasound of my kidneys. My fourth appointment, I had to go in and get um, whatever it is. Is it an electrocardiogram? I don't remember which one it is, like of my heart. 
The fifth appointment was really weird. I then just had to go out and yell fuck you at people who don't have health insurance. <laughs> All right, that's what I got. Thank you. <laughs> Ah, thank you, Claudia. How funny. Uh, please do come back. Uh, we're here every other Tuesday, uh, except for this month when it's every other other Tuesday. Uh, we'll be back on the 27th, um, our, last show. our last show for the season. Uh, please keep us in mind also, put it, us in your calendar on September 24th for an event to be announced. But I can tell you right now, it's up in Spite and Dival at a park. park, outdoors, Henry Hudson Park. Uh, so that's like the insight you have. Please do follow us on uh, Instagram at Art in the Basin and YouTube, Art in the Basin, as well as on Facebook, AITB Art in the Basin. Uh, so I understand Catherine is going to come back and like lay some words on us, which we're really happy about. Love to hear more. Would you like me to hold it? Because it has to be. Okay. Oh wow. wow. So um, I apologize for my um, uh, uh, in inability to do this before, and I appreciate a second chance. I feel like oh, a second chance. I got a second chance. <laughs> Oh, wow. Um, that's what I need in my life. <laughs> um, so, um, my landlord has taken over the world. He is collecting all the rent. He is out in the hall. He has a key to your lock. He says you got your kitchen, your half bedroom, your bathroom. So it adds up to a three to a three bedroom, check the records if you want. There is a new world order, my landlord. <laughs> he is renovating China. He is sorry, but they will have to move out until he is finished. Russia, he says, is not listed as stabilized. <coughs> France was never rent controlled. <coughs> Poland will get the keys when they pay the deposit. He went to Brazil and installed broken appliances he found on the street. Then he raised their rent. This he, <laughs> this he does all over the world. First, second, third, it's all the same now. It's all legal, he says, all on the up and up. The president came on TV and said that we have been invaded by my landlord. <laughs> but not to panic, just keep a list of everything wrong. <laughs> then the president spoke directly to my landlord. Get out now or the American people will kick your butt. <laughs> like I'm shaking in my boots, my landlord says. He has made it his business to know each and every one of his tenants personally. He knows what makes them tick, their ins and outs. I can make a rat pay rent, my landlord says, including <laughs> that one. And he turns the president off, checks to see if he has ever made a late payment, if he is behind. The president is way behind. He will be evicted. Unless, <laughs> unless he does what my landlord says, he will be on the street. There is a new world order, my landlord. He says he's putting all the world's trash in our backyard. He hates to throw anything out. He says he fixed my stove, it works now. He says my toilet is not stopped up. That leak upstairs is not a leak. The people up there are worse than stupid, he says, no matter how many times he tells them they do not know how to take a shower, right? <laughs> a few countries cannot pay rent. He turns a drip into a flood, a spark into a fire. He is insured. 
He can afford to wait. He is here for the long run. He knows you will cooperate. He is your new best friend. He is all you got. He is living two floors down. He is spending your rent at OTB. He is <laughs> absentee, but you are at home and you have begun to feel at home. You have begun to like it. You hear a knock on your door. He says you will do what he says. He is the new world order. He says to call this land, to call him the landlord. Oh. Oh, thank you. My, my second chance, thank you. Wow, it makes me feel like, wow, maybe I could have a second chance in life. Wow. Um, so this is a graphic novel that was published in 1998, actually by Hyperion. Um, uh, at 17, I had a kid and became a teenage single mother. To me, my child is the most beautiful thing in the world. I love to look at her at every movement. Well, anyway, I had a kid and decided I still wanted to be what I was becoming before I had a kid, which was I don't know what on account of I'm only 17. But someone said I made my bed so I should lie in it. Dreaming and dreaming of somewhere else, somewhere with no discouraging words. I asked my mother for help, but she raised three kids alone. My sister had four. I only had one, they said. I had it easy. Easy to dream. All I needed to make my dreams come true was money. So I went to work at the factory. We made surgical gloves. I was a stripper. I stripped the gloves <laughs> off the ceramic forms. I worked the 7.30 to 3.30 shift. I made incentive. I worked faster and faster and faster and faster. All the while dreaming dreams. My little Stacy had to go to the daycare center. When I left, she cried and cried. All day long, I thought of her alone in a crib. I promised her it wouldn't be forever, that we would soon be like the people in magazines. Okay, she said, but I could tell she didn't mean it. Inside Stacy's brain, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I want to go. <laughs> I got a promotion at work. Now I was going to be an inspector. That meant you inspected the gloves for pinholes. Holes kill, they told me. My job is an inspector. I pick up a glove from a box on my right and stretch it over a hole on my table. Then I push my air button with my foot and look at the blown up glove for holes. I made incentive. I worked faster and faster. There were hundreds of us in a big room under the fluorescent lights, thumb pushing our buttons. Who we were were all women there under the light in the big white room, thumb pushing our air buttons, wearing a hairnet, wearing a face mask, covered in talc. I do not know why there were no men. We had talc in our ears, our eyes, under our bras. Who we were were all women covered in white talc, taking a 10 minute break, a 30 minute lunch, moving by bells. That is until we went out on strike. Then we were all women out of a job. I got to be at home with Stacy. For a week we played. Then I counted the days until the rent, the electric, the gas, the phone. We were in a pickle. All the factories in my town were not hiring or else they were closed. They all moved south. My town was becoming a ghost town without a job in sight. Everything was making me forget that what I was doing was trying to get back to becoming what I was becoming before I became pregnant. I wanted to be a person becoming something, not a person out of a job, a person using her savings to pay the rent. I decided to lie about my age and become a waitress. <laughs> <laughs> that was about my struggle to go to college as a teenage mother. Um, Death Hill. It was a bumpy brick street straight down, then another block downhill to Fulton, the busiest street in Canton, Ohio. Joe Vitale lived in the yellow house at the top of Death Hill, 
and all day we could hear him practicing his drums, the cymbals crashing, the bass thumping, the sticks hitting all the drums faster and faster. We started out no-handed and could not touch the handlebars until we hit the park. At Fulton, we looked both ways, but we had to keep up the speed, using our balance to swerve through the cars. At the park, we bumped over the curb and slid into the grass. Then it was the long haul back up the hill. Occasionally, some kid would be killed, but it didn't stop us. We couldn't be chicken, not in our neighborhood. Years later on 34th Street, I am pathetically clutching my coupons for pennies to buy my grandkids some t-shirts at 50% off. People are rushing off from the subway, pushing me out of the way on their way to Madison Square Garden. I look up and see the Eagles on the marquee with Joe Vitale as the drummer. Oh, Joe Vitale, I could not hear what you had to say back then, but now I swear I'm finally ready to listen. <laughs> there were four houses on Doherty Street, close enough to stay up all night walking, talking through windows, close enough to know each other's feelings. Ricky, the best looking guy in all of Canton, Ohio, and Randy, the football star, lauded, lauded in the paper every night, had a bedroom window a few feet from mine. All night we talked. Across the street was Susie, the most beautiful girl in all of Canton, and Debbie, the straight-A student. I was the artist who drew our posters for backyard festivals and horses for no reason. Susie went to work at the rectory to pay her school tuition. Everything was provided. There were adults, but we never noticed them. Susie and Debbie's sister went off to college, and of course we would too. I would be an artist. Debbie would be a physicist or a doctor. Susie would be a theologian, since she was the most religious. Randy would be a comedian with his own show. Ricky's good looks would open doors wherever he went. Everything would go our way, and we would be together laughing forever. Randy went off to Vietnam and was never the same, in and out of institutions, bloated up on Thorazine, padding around in his hospital slippers and open-backed hospital gown. Ricky ended up on crack, in and out of jail, until he died too young. I was pregnant at 17. Debbie's father died in her senior year of high school, and after discovering he had another family, her mother went to wandering naked at night and Debbie had to care for her. Susie worked as a secretary for a steel company that went belly up, leaving her with nothing. No, no college for any of us, no dreams, no future. Up in our dark and dismal Rust Belt town, the four houses now bulldozed or falling in, the roofs collapsed, the windows boarded up. Oh, thank you. My art teacher, Mr. Ryman summarily taught us the basics. A human head is seven, a, a human is seven heads tall. The eyes are in the middle of the head. The train tracks recede to the horizon. The city buildings have two vanishing points. We sat six to a wooden table scribbling away. For most of us, it was an easy A, a goof off period, I wanted to be the best artist Mr. Ryman had ever known. I wanted to win awards, to be serious, but I am sure I was just as stupidly silly as all the rest. He never seemed to care. Instead, he showed me the life of an artist, sitting on a low stool on his side of the room, bent over his painting, mixing his paints, his back turned away from the world.
I'm cutting this shorter than I than I was going to. Um, and I hope that's I hope that's good. I wish I could draw a map to the place I am supposed to be. Is it here? Oh, I wrote this. Um, I, I take Maria Maziotti Gillen's poetry class, and she has a retreat where we go and um, stay in an 800 acre convent in New Jersey for the weekend. And she it's a wonderful poetry experience. Um, so I wrote this at that place. So I wish I could draw a map to the place I am supposed to be. Is it here, walking up the hill today, seeing the mushrooms, the tiny rose flowers, the dandelions ready to be blown away on another day, not this rainy day. Poets love rain, and I think of E.E. E. Cummings' line, to be unto love as rain is unto, unto color. A poet I loved at 16. Anyway, walking up the hill, I love the bright, like green of the grass, the milky green of the lichen, the rocks darker and trees misty blue in the distance. I thought, is this where I'm supposed to be? Is it in the red rocky hills of Colorado, the Sierra Nevada, Santa Cruz, Bisbee, San Miguel, Allende, Mallorca, Goa, India, Palenque, Tulum, Patagonia, Bahia, Paros, Greece, or right here, at, that, at this Formica, Formica fake wood desk writing this poem. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for the second chance. Thank you, Catherine. Let's hear it again for Catherine Arnoldi. Thank you so much for that. Uh, really glad you uh, came back. Uh, she was reading from the amazing true story of a teenage single mom. I was looking over her shoulder, and man, what a beautiful addition! Like hardcover, and like graphics were like really cool and everything. But what a what a special publication! So thank you uh, for reading from that. Uh, let's see here. What else? Oh, you know, we heard all about talc <laughs> and where it ends up. Thank you for that. And uh, finally, um, Canton, Ohio. My ex-wife is from Youngstown, Ohio. Just and yeah, it's, you know, um, we always stopped at the Canton Airport before the Youngstown Airport in the little mud puddle jumper planes that we would take from Chicago. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I really wanted to not remember this, but my ex-wife, now that she is, uh, you know, come about as a topic, it's her birthday today. She was born on June 6th. My dad's birthday today. Oh, okay. Well, much cooler than, you know, my ex-wife having a birthday today uh, in appreciation uh, for him and June 6 heroes, right? Uh, so anyway, let me just say thanks again to uh, Monomore Coffee and Wine for having us. We'll be back on June 27th. So please do join us then and follow us on our various social media. Thank you again, Catherine Arnoldi, for coming out tonight. Thank you also, everybody, for braving the smoke-filled air that we're having in New York City today. Uh, and I guess we will, uh, we'll, okay, I have to fill a little more time. She's still talking. Uh, <laughs> what can I say? Oh, oh, no, no, she's back. Uh, we will like bring back uh, our co-host with the most, uh, Amy Joy Roboto. Uh, she's the brains behind the operation. And so please be attentive. Thank you, Tim W. Brown, everyone, right? <laughs> right.
And only because he's here tonight, I'm going to ask Jeff to come on up. Jeff, come on. Woo! Jeff Garcia, everybody. Mona Moore Coffee and Wine. Um, obviously, I really love having you all here. Uh, this is something that we've been doing since basically opened. Ooh, and, I had no idea. <clears throat> yeah, and it's grown. And obviously, we really appreciate you guys and having everyone from our community here uh, spending time with us is really awesome. So we are obviously looking forward to the 27th. And then obviously, there'll be a little break, right? So you guys can all get your work and work on your poems and your poetry and your, um, uh, you know, songs <laughs> and you know everything, everything that people come up here to do and say comedy. So, we you know, some magicians. yes, so we look forward uh, to having you back in the fall and, you know, getting us through the, the cold winter with your warm words. Oh, Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Jeff. And obviously, Amy, amazing. Thank you obviously, for putting it together. Thank you, sir. You guys, you know, rock. Thank you. Dynamic duo, us too, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so... I mean, come on, right? Like, we had a great time tonight, didn't we? Didn't we have a great time tonight? This is why you have to be in this room with us to feel that energy, but we got energy from the Zoom room. Thank you, Elegant and Irie Duro. Thank, thank you, Ted. Um, thank you, Catherine Arnaldi, for coming back and gracing us with your amazing art and your beautiful words. L where can we find your, your book? You can, you can check it out on the library. And the name of it is? Okay. The Amazing True Story of a Teenage Mom. Find it at your local library, correct? Find it at your local Amazon. <laughs> and we always end on the same three words. If you haven't been here before, the words are let love lead. So we're going to say it in unison. Ready? On du toi. Let's love lead. Yes, but if you're here with me in 2023, you know what you got to do, right? What do you have to do? Lead, let love. That's right. You lead. You're at the helm. This is your ship. Sail it smoothly and into the bright sun, everybody. We love you. Have a good night. We'll see you June 27th. Ciao.